sponsored by Skillshare. Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I'm here to talk about some of the books I've been reading this summer, and I've been on a pretty good reading stretch lately, so I'm going to wrap up the first batch of summer reads today and then be back in a couple of weeks to wrap up the rest of them. And the first books I wanted to mention are Luster by Raven Leilani, Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan, and The Lot by Brian Washington, which I reviewed in a joint video about millennial fiction that I'll link down below. I highly recommend all of these books. They're three of the best books I've read so far this year, so definitely check out that video down below if you want to hear more of my thoughts about each of those. And then I wanted to talk about Lincoln in the Bardo by George Saunders, which is a book that I actually read way back in late March, early April. And at the time I was having a little trouble putting my thoughts together about this book, and for a little while I was planning on doing a full review of it, and then I never did. So anyway, here I am, finally ready to talk about it. For Four months later. This book won the Man Booker Prize back in 2017 and was definitely the literary darling of that year. And as someone who had no interest in reading it when it first came out, I went into this book with pretty low expectations, and as a result I was really pleasantly surprised by it. This book takes place in February 1862 and unfolds over the course of a single night, the night after 11-year-old Willie Lincoln, the most beloved son of President Abraham Lincoln, has been laid to rest after succumbing to typhoid fever. And the story opens on two men in a Washington graveyard who, it quickly becomes apparent, are ghosts or spirits who have not yet moved on to whatever awaits them in the next life. They then encounter the spirit of Willie Lincoln and become quite alarmed because it's not good for young children to tarry in the cemetery after they've died. But Willie is lingering because he's waiting for his father, who makes several visits to the crypt over the course of the night in order to hold the body of his son one last time, which makes it immensely difficult for these ghosts to convince Willie that he is indeed dead and needs to move on. So that's kind of the central tension of the book, this push and pull between one life and the next. But there are other interesting tensions at play here as well, kind of the tension between Judeo-Christian ideas of the afterlife and, for example, Buddhist ideas of what lies after death. There's also a tension between Abraham Lincoln as a father to his son Willie and this intimate portrait of one man's all-consuming grief, and then this idea of Lincoln as the father of the country and this man who is sending many other people's sons off to die in a war that in 1862 is far from decided. And Saunders explores that idea in particular through these snippets of historical documents, some real and some invented that are spliced throughout the book. And the rest of the novel is structured somewhat like a play and is filled with this chorus of voices from all the various ghosts and spirits in the cemetery who have been unable to let go of their lives on earth. And although this book is quite weird and fairly out there at times, as a portrait of grief, both the grief of people who are left behind and the grief of people who must leave, I found the whole thing tremendously moving and really humane. It's a really, really lovely book, and it's not quite like anything I've ever read before, so if there's anyone out there who, like me, was really holding out on Lincoln and the Bardo, I do encourage you to go check it out. Another excellent book that I read recently was A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, which is her 1959 play about the Youngers, a multi-generational Black family living in a cramped apartment on Chicago's South Side who have dreams and aspirations of maybe one day moving out to the predominantly white suburbs. And when I was in high school, we read a number of 20th century American plays that were basically all exploring how the American dream is a bust. Plays like Death of a Salesman, Long Day's Journey into Night, Fences, The Glass Menagerie, and I really do feel like A Raisin in the Sun fits into that tradition perfectly, and so it was really fascinating to read it in that context and with those other plays in mind. But even on its own, the way that A Raisin in the Sun depicts how individual human hopes and dreams are crushed by and yet persist under the unbearable weight of history and circumstance and man-made injustice. It's just 
a knockout. And the way that Lorraine Hansberry writes Walter Younger in particular, who is the patriarch of the family, although in many ways his mother, mama, is still kind of the head of the household, the way Lorraine Hansberry captures his proud yet precarious masculinity, his dreams that are both stifled and deferred, but that also feel so limitless and untamable, and like the Langston Hughes poem, about to explode. The way she writes him as both this infuriatingly stubborn character and also this entirely sympathetic and vulnerable one is really remarkable. She somehow manages to make you feel both completely exhausted by him as your heart is breaking for him. And to be clear, Lorraine Hansberry also does this with every other major character in the play, whether it's Walter or Ruth or Mama or Benita. She captures every angle of their being and every feeling that is churning inside them, whether it's being expressed overtly or not. And it all just feels so prescient, like Lorraine Hansberry absolutely preternaturally had her finger on the pulse of American life and on the pulse of Black experience in America in all of its multitudes. So much so that even though this play was written over 60 years ago, it feels like it could have been written yesterday. And not just because America, infuriatingly, is still a super racist society, but because Lorraine Hansberry fundamentally understands every corner of the human heart in a way that is just completely timeless. Next up, I have Sula by Toni Morrison, which is the second Toni Morrison novel that I've ever read, and the first one that I've read since high school. And I, perhaps unsurprisingly, thought it was great. It's set in the fictional town of Medallion, Ohio, in a Black neighborhood called The Bottom, and it follows two girls, Nell and Sula, and it follows them through the decades, through their girlhood and young adulthood and into their later years as they separate and come together and separate again. And it also follows various tertiary characters who make up the community that is the bottom. And I'm obviously not the first person to make this observation, but Toni Morrison's power of description and the way that she's able to use language to evoke not only images, but also mood and atmosphere and a sense of shared stories and shared history. She writes in a way that makes you feel like you could reach out and wrap your hands around the air that she describes between two characters. And it's just impossible to not love the feeling of being immersed in that kind of language. Even when the things that she's describing are at times horrifying and, you know, run the whole gamut of human experience out to its most extreme edges. Just as an example of what I loved so much about this novel, the book opens with a vignette about a young veteran named Shadrach who wakes up in a hospital bed in France, shell-shocked, and who goes back to his hometown of Medallion, back to the bottom, where he is forever changed by his experiences in the war. And that opening chapter is so powerful and evocative that you just assume the whole book is going to be about Shadrach. How could it not be? When in fact, he's just a peripheral character in the lives of Nell and Sula, who the book is ultimately actually about. But that is the immeasurable talent of Toni Morrison, that ability to evoke instantly a world and a character in a very short amount amount of space. So yeah, I thought it was great and we'll hopefully get to more Toni Morrison later this year. As I mentioned at the top of the video, this wrap-up is kindly sponsored by the people over at Skillshare, which is an amazing online learning platform with thousands of different classes to help you explore your creativity and develop new skills. Lately, I've really been enjoying Skillshare's huge treasure trove of classes and resources for aspiring writers or for people like me who are just interested in hearing other writers talk about their approach to craft. Skillshare has so many amazing classes in that area with so many awesome and established writers, including one with Roxane Gay called Crafting Personal Essays with Impact. And what I really loved about the class was how she kind of gets into how to develop your ideas and how to flesh them out on a craft and writing level, but then she also gets 
into the kind of nitty gritty of being a writer and how to revise your drafts and how to get published and kind of things like that. Like all Skillshare classes, this one has interactive projects to help you develop your skills and it also connects you with a community of millions of other online learners. Skillshare is also one of the most affordable ways to learn online with annual premium membership coming in at less than $10 a month. And if you click on the link in the description box below, the first 1,000 people who sign up will get two free months of premium membership. Switching gears, next up I have One to Watch by Kate Stamen London, which follows B. Schumacher, who is a plus-size fashion blogger and influencer, and one night she sits down and writes a scathing critique on her blog of a bachelor-esque reality dating show called Main Squeeze, calling the show out for its lack of body diversity. The post goes viral and she ends up being asked to be the show's first ever plus size lead. And that's complicated by the fact that she is trying to get over this guy who she's been hung up on for years, and also because she kind of naturally has her guard up being a fat woman on the internet who has had to put up with her fair share of trolls and various other bullshit. But she does end up agreeing to it, thinking it would be a smart career move, i.e. she's not in it for the right reasons. And to that point, it's very obvious that Kate Stamen London is a member of Bachelor Nation. She definitely knows the show's formula and all of its various producer and editing tricks. There are several plot points in this book that feel like allusions to various dramatic moments that have happened in past seasons of The Bachelor. And as someone who not infrequently dips my toe into the black hole that is Bachelor Reddit, and as someone who is currently trying to figure out what the f is going on with Claire and Tasha, I definitely appreciated that this book is so fluent in all of the mechanics of the show that it is so transparently based on. And in general, so much of this book is so well done and so charming and so fun and watching B kind of grow into herself and realize that she's a person who's worthy of love was really touching and also really well developed. That being said, in terms of conflict, I do feel like this book kind of went back to the same well over and over again. And then the book's other fatal flaw was that the main romance was not very convincing and also just wasn't that cute and I wasn't a fan of it. I tried to convince myself that I was a fan of it, but then days after finishing it, I was like, that kind of sucked. I feel like in an attempt to kind of mimic reality television and keep things unpredictable, the author introduced way too much conflict and angst into the central relationship with hardly any swoon whatsoever. A bad edit, if you will. So yeah, as a story of self-discovery and a kind of spoof on reality TV filled with lots of fun pop culture references, it was really great. As a romance, it was a complete and utter failure. And lastly, I'm working on this YA book for work that I read the manuscript of a few weeks ago, and it was so cute and so charming and one of those books that just makes you feel warm and cozy inside several days after the fact. And it really kind of unexpectedly made me very nostalgic for a lot of the kind of cute books that I read when I was in like middle school, particularly the Meg Cabot books, which I feel like were kind of YA before YA was fully a thing. And so on a total whim, I downloaded All American Girl from my library, which is a book that I remember f loving when I was like 12, 13. I genuinely can't remember, but it follows this 15 year old artsy girl named Samantha who inadvertently saves the life of the US president during a would-be assassination attempt and then proceeds to fall in love with his son David, who she realizes is cute David from her afternoon drawing classes. Very pre-internet in that she didn't like make that connection before. So yeah, I reread this book in like two sittings, which for me is lightning speed. And I enjoyed it while also being like, mm, this was probably a mistake. <laughs> because I don't really read a lot of YA personally right now, but I get the impression that today's YA is written with an adult audience at least partially in mind just because a lot of adults like to read YA fiction. I'm not sure, but in contrast, All American Girl was definitely from an era where YA books were written 
solely for like teens and tweens, i.e. not intended for 27 year old Claire in the year 2020. It's very much written in teen speak, which was hilarious and outdated and just like a blast from the past. And there's also definitely some stuff in it that has not aged particularly well. Although I was impressed with how like genuinely funny and charming it often was, but it's also definitely a Bush era book about like white kids who watch MTV and for whom the concept of identity politics is still stuck in the like popular cheerleader art girl who wears all black and listens to ska dichotomy. So yeah, not that deep, definitely a throwback that I had a fun time revisiting while also wishing that I hadn't like vaguely tarnished my memory of it. Those are some of the books I've been reading this summer. I'll be back again soon to talk about the rest of my summer reads, but in the meantime, let me know if you've read any of these books, what you've been reading this summer, if you've done any kind of ill-advised rereads of the books you loved when you were 12. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks to Skillshare again for sponsoring this video, and as always, thanks to you for watching. I will see you again soon. Bye!